were summoned from the hillside. They were called in from the glen. And the country found them ready at the stirring call for men. Let no tears add to their hardships as the soldiers march along. And although your hearts are breaking, make them sing. is the National News Bulletin, a summary of the day's news. The dagger pointed at the heart of Berlin has been driven into the side of Nazi Europe. The first news of the mightiest military operation of all history came at 38 minutes past midnight, Eastern Daylight Time, last night, when the Germans broadcast a report that Le Havre was being bombarded. June 6th, 1944, D-Day. A massive attack force heads for the beaches of Normandy. After almost five years of war, the fortunes of battle have taken a decisive turn. We lived in a kind of... Uh chasm between our regular lives and the wartime experience, but they were intense years, and I would have to say that because they were so intense, because they brought such a lot of experience, we've never forgotten them, and we were shaped by them. These are the faces of the generation who fought the Second World War, on the home front and overseas. They have memories of the best and the worst of human experience. They remember those who never returned. Young people from a young nation. Through six years of war, both they and their country would be forever changed. They came from all across Canada in the first month, 70,000 enlisted, farmers and city boys, loggers and fishermen, from different communities, different cultures. A nation of 11.3 million put over one million of its citizens into uniform. I joined the Army, well, for two reasons. One, uh, of course, the obvious one, the Air Force wouldn't take me. The reason, I suppose, was that uh, I was, what, 18 when I joined the militia. Uh, I felt very strongly, as all my compatriots did, all my friends and peer group did, that what was happening in Europe had to be stopped. We read our papers and we listened to the radio. Uh, and we received as much propaganda as people always do from those two sources. But under the propaganda, there was a thread. And the thread was that something virulently evil was happening. And unless it was stopped, it was probably all over for all of us. I'm the oldest one of four boys. My father is sitting down to supper with us. He says, you know, son, he says, there's a war on, eh? I said, yeah. He says, what are you going to do about it? So I guess the next day I went down and signed in to go out into the Navy. When I wanted to enlist, I went to the recruiting office, and I weighed only 90 pounds, although I was five foot six. And the young medical officer said that I was to go home and put on weight for two weeks, and if I could increase my weight by two pounds in two weeks, he'd accept me. Well, I was a Canadian, and so I just come back to Canada. 
and joined up. I couldn't get in at the States because they were not at war. When there's a war on, I felt I had to go. It was as simple as that. I went to the Navy and lied and forgot my birth certificate until they forgot to ask me anymore. You know, it was sort of the patriotic thing to do, but at the same time, there was the attraction of the uniform. I know a lot of girls that wouldn't give me the time of day in school sure talked to me a lot after I got the uniform on. It all happened so quickly, many who enlisted in 1939 had to wait for the uniforms to be made. But in just a few months, they were outfitted and trained and set sail for England. I can remember the astonishment with which I looked out over the rail of our particular troop ship at this array of vessels, ships, ships, ships of all kinds, in all directions as far as the eye could reach. To be part of anything as huge, as massive, and in a sense as sublime as that was the most moving thing that I had experienced. It was the first time that I'd been scaled down to proper size for, to become a soldier. And I think that launched me into the war better than all the basic training I ever had. By the middle of 1940, 25,000 Canadian soldiers had crossed the Atlantic to defend England and continue their training. Britain now stood alone against the Third Reich. Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, France, all had been conquered. A Nazi assault on England seemed imminent. Hitler assembled an invasion fleet. Canada was Britain's only ally in a position to help. The Canadian soldiers were eager to be part of a major offensive. But for a long time to come, all they were asked to do was train. Marching, training, waiting, bored with army routine. The Canadians were glad to have a little excitement from home. Under the big top in Guildford, the latest Canadian Army show gets away to a good start. When it comes to the winter scene and the skating routines, many Canucks in the audience get a touch of homesickness for the deep Dominion snows. Nightly bombing raids made it impossible to ignore the fact that a war was being waged. Hitler's strategy was to break the will of the British people by destroying their cities. The battle for Britain was to be fought not on the land or at sea, but in the air. These are the few to whom so much was owed. The RAF with 55 squadrons of hurricanes and spitfires and a few hundred fighter pilots, including 60 Canadians, drove the Luftwaffe bombers from the skies over England. During the Blitz, thousands spent their nights in air raid shelters. A million and a half women and children were evacuated to the British countryside. 